Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Brash, bald-faced blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. I have failed you. I have. I am a failure this week. Time and again, I get emails from people when they call the podcast or they make mention on the Facebook page how much they appreciate the Thinking Atheist community and the overall tack I take with it, which is an everyman kind of a thing. I love to laugh. I love people. I really enjoy the, the, you know, the, the idea that we could come together and exchange ideas and even disagree and somehow still get along like people. We can be opponents without being enemies, right? They say, Seth, I love your sense of humor. You love to laugh and you're so jovial and you seem like the kind of guy who, who would, you know, I'd like to go have a beer with. We listen to you in the car. We listen to you when we're home. I listen to you between study breaks. I listen to you here. I listen to you at the office, wherever. And we really enjoy the fact that you're so accessible and so easy to listen to. You don't have that thing that so many atheist shows have that makes it angry and acerbic and it's just toxic and you just I failed I failed this week because I am not myself I feel a little bit of that 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 just you know what I'm saying I always talk about people who Say, they made me this way whenever they are a certain way. They made me act this way. They provoked me. (laughs) And I always feel like that's a cop out. Obviously, you are in control of your own actions and you control your own mindset. And you are the one who is ultimately responsible. And I still hold to that, which is why I am a failure. Because at this moment, I'm just livid, impatient, put out, frustrated, sick to death. Let me back up. When I finally came out to my family, it was after a period of searching. I had found the answers that religion was providing me unsatisfactory. So I started to, you know, test the boundaries a little bit and see, well, maybe all this religion, maybe this Christianity, maybe this scripture, maybe God, maybe, well, maybe I just need to test it a little bit to make sure it's solid. And I go and I start asking questions to members of my religious family, some of who are actually, quote-unquote, theologians, educated theologians. The answers I get back are not satisfactory. Now, when you start asking questions and you start hearing the wrong answers, I mean, not just, hmm, that sounds odd, but really odd, really wrong, really bogus, And you do a little digging and you realize, wait a minute. So you start asking more questions. That's exactly what happened. 
I started with my family, just asking questions. Ask a few questions here or there. Let them know I have some concerns. So oh, I'll pray for you. Uh, here, read this book. Here, try this scripture. You know what? You just need the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know what? We're. I know. I. I went through a time in my life when I just. I tested. I had. I went through the valley, but I just know God is going to use this time to bring you back into the fold, and it's all going to work together. All things work together for for good to those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. Purpose. Let me get an eight, man. Three years, it was over three years ago, I finally came to that point of critical mass and I told my family, I am an atheist, said the word. Big step for me. And those who've come out of a devoutly religious family probably feel the same. I'm an atheist. I actually said the word. And because many people are, well, you don't, we don't believe you're not religious. Oh, that's one. Okay. Whatever. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you. But if you say atheist, there's a finality to that word. I had someone actually send a Facebook message. Seth, I knew you were going through a tough time, but an, but an atheist, the word just set off alarm bells. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> oh, Houston, we have a problem. He said he was an atheist. Three years ago, I think early in the year, it's all a blur right now, but I want to say it was January, February-ish. I finally just, and what's funny is that in the background, I was already putting designs together for the thinkingatheist.com website, hoping to take some of the stuff, some of the research that I had done and put it in a palatable form to perhaps help others. So I was really jumping out into the deep water. And I began to get the arguments back. The long emails, right? Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. He didn't ask for them. I actually sent, um, because I was worried about hearsay in my own family, did you hear about Seth? Did you hear about him? I think he's going through some kind of a crisis. I don't know what's wrong with him. He's, I feel like I've failed as a parent. I don't know. We need to pray for him. I say this in love. I say it in love, but I mean, he's really gone. Wow. I mean, I just don't know what we're going to do. I think we've got to do something. Someone's got to intervene. Instead of letting that go on and on and on, I took the bull by the horns, decided to get on the front end of it, and I sent a long email. And I said, everybody in my family, and I, I included everybody, love all of you. I want you to know I'm the same guy I've always been. I'm, the same, I'm still Seth, the same guy I've always been. But I want you to know, you've probably heard that I have had some challenges with my faith. And I believe it's important to tell all of you at the outset that I no longer believe in God. And I actually went through the basic reasons why. Obviously, it's impossible to go through all the reasons after 18 months of questions and answers and searching. But I included, as I'm trying to remember it now, I wish I'd saved the email. I didn't. I wish I'd saved it. But I talked about um, the uh, inaccurate, historical inaccuracy in Scripture the contradictions in the Bible, many of those contradictions you can see on my website. Taking an objective and fresh look at the true nature of the Christian God, Yahweh. No longer seeing Yahweh as a moral character to be admired and worshipped. I included tidbits about science, talked about the Hubble constant, being able to trace our universe 13.7 billion years back to a singular event which took place. Talking about the fossil record. I mean, I, I, I included specifics that stood against the scripture I was supposedly it's supposed to adhere to, right? And the science that made more sense. I thought I laid it out pretty well for a first strike. It was the first time I'd really put it all out there like that, you know. Sent it out to everybody. Big family. Big family. Big family I come from. I got five siblings. 
And they got kids. Everybody's procreating in this. We got kids everywhere. People everywhere. Brothers and sisters and uncles and everybody. I got one email back the following day. Sounds to me like you're just religious about your atheism. Sounds to me like you're promoting atheism. Nobody else asked any questions. Nobody else apparently wanted to know. Isn't that weird? Even a morbid curiosity. Really, Seth, how'd you get there? What a huge 180 this is from what you... You were on... You, you, you used to... You used to speak from the, from the stage. You used to... They used to when you were in youth group, you led youth day and went out and actually gave the sermon in church, which I did. You were a spokesperson for Youth for Christ. You loved Christian music. You were on Christian radio for so many years. You've done so much great work for churches. How, how could this happen? What is it that drove your decision to reverse everything and start a new course? Not one person. Not one. Nobody. Seems to me, I mean, I would be, I would be on the edge of my seat. Oh, what happened to you? Let's get some coffee. And it wouldn't, I don't think it would be that condescending. You tell me what happened to you. Not me, him. You probably, I will counsel you back to Jesus. I, I honestly think I'm curious. Tell me a story. I'll buy dinner. Come on. Nobody. Early 2009. And then, and then the emails start to come in. The emails, each one having a different argument. Talking about, first of all, they equated evolution with atheism, which is a huge mistake. It doesn't even make sense. If you believe in evolution, you must be an atheist. No. But I heard him on both sides. Threw Hitler's name out every once in a while. Just for variety. Talked about the evidence science has discovered that proves that all of humankind came from a single mother. That's almost a direct quote, by the way. Came from a single mother. It's been proven by science. Where do you get your morals from? You just want to go out and act any way you want. You know what? You're in rebellion right now. And because you don't want to be accountable morally, you have rejected the moral standard. This is a midlife crisis. How old are you? You're 41? Mm-hmm. Time and again, I would receive these, and I got better and better at it as we went along because I was hearing some of the same arguments in my own circle outside of family, and I was listening to some of the input starting to come back when the thinkingatheist.com YouTube page and the uh, .com website went live in May of 2009, and people started to have dialogue. We had a few hundred people that were participating, and I started to hear, I'd get the emails, you know, Adolf Hitler was an atheist. I would have to go and do a little homework and decide, well, wait a minute, wait, was he an atheist? I need to go and get some facts. Imagine that. He wasn't, by the way. Talking about morality. Talking about... The fossil record, transitional fossils. Einstein had a deathbed conversion, I heard. So did Darwin. That's what they said. And more often than not, I got these long general emails that just said, science is, is largely walking away from evolution. Mm -hmm, they're not. In fact, there's a revival going on in America right now. Just these broad, unsubstantiated, unsighted, undocumented statements. They just throw them out there like candy. There's a revival going on in America right now. And you, you know what? You're, you're in the minority right now. Science, legitimate science. It knows evolution is bogus. Well, every time I would get an email like this at the beginning, I would obviously go off on my quest to find legitimate information. 
is what they say true? And the more I would see the legitimate information, the more frustrated I would become. But then I would refute it. I'd send the email back and say, well, this is wrong. Here's some sources. Here's a book. Here's this. Here's an evolutionary biologist. And if you don't like him, here's five others. You know, here's someone who's actually a, 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 an astronomer who can speak about uh, the Hubble constant, a cosmologist. Here's someone who can, here's a scientist. Here, here's a, here's a, an actual historian who went to the Holy Land and is, is convinced, Bart Ehrman or otherwise, is convinced the evidence proves that you cannot trust the Bible as historically accurate. You certainly can't use it as a document for a living, blah, blah, blah. I refute, refute. And we finally got to a point, I think it was almost a whole year, just one volley after the other, always laced with, well, you know what? I love you. I love you. And I'm just, I'm, I'm praying for you. I'll just pray for you. I'm praying for you. After a year, I finally started to say, enough. This is no longer a dialogue. You're not listening, right? I've refuted everything you've tossed at me. I, and I've documented it. I respect your desire to believe as you wish. I, I honestly, I, I did not once go knock on anybody else's door in my family and say, you got to see this. Here, read this by Carl Sagan or Neil deGrasse Tyson or Daniel Dennett or Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Dan Barker, anybody new. I left him totally alone. I, in fact, I created the, the online community so that I could have people to talk to and interact with without having to worry about making any of my relatives uncomfortable. I wasn't on a mission to convert them. They have been on a perpetual mission to convert me. After a year, I was like, enough, look, enough, enough. It's been a year. It's time to respect boundaries, okay? Let's be a family. We have so much else we can celebrate together. We have so much else we can enjoy together. We can agree to disagree on this issue, and we can still be a family. That's all I want. Let's spend time together doesn't have to be the elephant in the room. It doesn't have to be this way. Let it go. And the emails keep coming. And the calls. Just the non-stop. Day after day. Week after week. And, the, and they're paper-thin arguments. Paper-thin Arguments that have been long ago debunked. So you go from, all right, look, I know you love me. I know you love me. I know you're doing this out of love. I know you're motivated by love. I know that you want to fix me. I know that you are operating from a, a very high uh, degree of sincerity. And I appreciate that in you. I love you so much. Yes, I do. I love you so much. Please just stop. Let's talk about something else. No, I don't want another email. No, I don't need you to bring this book to so-and-so's birthday dinner. No, I don't want a link to the uh, Christian Answers website. I don't need, I don't want. I don't agree. I think I've made my position clear. I am done arguing. Please, let's move on. Let's be a family. Two years pass. Two and a half years pass. Three years pass. Yesterday, I get another link. And I became the person I did not want to become. <laughs> I just freaking snapped. The article was listed in WorldNetDaily, WND.com, which is a conservative publication. And the article is titled, Evolution to Fall in 2012? Question mark. Three trends suggesting Americans rejecting Darwin's theory. I'll just read part of the article to you. It says, proponents of atheistic evolution have been hit with some bad news lately. 
which has one leading author proclaiming 2012 may be a tough year for Charles Darwin's theory of human origins. A Gallup survey, Google.com search trends, and some Amazon.com sales numbers all suggest evolution's ideological opponent, creationism, is on the rise in America. The article continues, Last week, for example, the Gallup polling organization released a survey indicating that the percentage of young Earth creationists in the United States has not only increased in the last two years, but also remains the most common explanation for humans' origins believed by Americans. The article states, quote, 46% of Americans believe in the creationist view that God created humans in their present form at one time within the last 10,000 years. <laughs> Sorry, I choke on that. <coughs> Ooh. <coughs> Sorry about that. The prevalence of this creationist view of the origin of humans is essentially unchanged from 30 years ago when Gallup first asked the question. Then it goes on to promote a book by Carl Gallups, G-A-L-L-U-P-S, author of the book, The Magic Man in the Sky, Effectively Defending the Christian Faith. Carl Gallups goes on to talk about some scientific-sounding gobbledygook. Like this, quote, Chapter 18, when we ingest other living things, the DNA of those living things, fruits, vegetables, nuts, meals, etc., just happens to be compatible with our DNA so that cellular respiration can take place. If it were not for the fact that our DNA is so akin to all other living things, we could not eat. If we could not eat, we would die. Is the process of eating and cellular respiration the result of a mere fluke of evolution? Alternatively, could it be that a common designer made certain that the process of eating and cellular respiration would function in such a precise and perfect manner? Which answer appears to be the most probable to you? I'll spare you the rest of the article. But I, unlike my family member who sent the article, did a little homework and found out who the author, Carl Gallups, was. And... Big surprise! He's not even a scientist. His own website biography lists him as pastor, conference leader, evangelist, talk radio host, commentator, and a former law enforcement officer. So... My family member brandished a defiant, bold, and yes, authoritative argument on evolutionary biology written by a cop. Now, if the cop had written a book on local law enforcement, wonderful. But why is the religious community denying and discarding all of these amazing works by legitimate evolutionary biologists and experts in their fields so that they can listen to this guy? And why do I have to again receive something in my email box that is completely worthless? So you receive an email like that and you have a conversation in your mind. You say, well, I'm not going to reply. I'm not going to respond. It's been three years. It's been three years. I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to respond. What a waste of time. I'm not going to change anybody's mind. I waste them. Let's waste my time. I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to respond. And you know what happens? You look at something like that and you say, on some level, I say, <laughs> this has to be refuted. If I don't respond then this argument does not get refuted in this inner circle here. I have a responsibility to refute it. <sighs> so I do it. I've replied, so you sent a link to a Gallup poll which reveals 
that 46% believe in the creationist view. But if I may quote James Randi, quote, no amount of belief makes something a fact. <laughs> so what if 46% of Americans believe anything? They believe it. Mm -hmm. That proves something. No, it doesn't. No amount of belief makes something a fact. A Harris poll from 2009 showed that more Americans support evolution by natural selection, 45%, than creationism, which at the time was 40%. And while 90% of Americans supposedly believe in God, and you hear the religious throw that statistic out all the time, 9 out of 10 Americans believe in God. You know something's going on. Mm -hmm. 9 out of 10 people can't be wrong. Well, if you go a little deeper... You find out that the definition of God is all over the place. Of those 9 out of 10, 42% believe in ghosts. 32%, 1 in 3, believe in UFOs, little green men. 26% believe in astrology. 1 in 4 believe their destiny is written in the stars. 23% believe in witches. 20%. One in five believe in reincarnation, yet all of these fall under the God umbrella, which reveals just how splintered and subjective people are on the issue of what God is, who God is, why God is, where God is. <sighs> Evolution so overwhelmingly documented that even the church with its back against the wall, has to endorse it. And I know many churches do not, but I mean, the Pope, the Pope, <laughs> says there, it says evolution's true. How, how jacked Francis Collins, founder of the Human Genome Project, evangelical Christian, says not only is evolution true, but that the Adam and Eve story in Genesis cannot account for the origin of our species. That's from a believer. <sighs> Finally, I said, do you want to learn about evolution from somebody educated and experienced, respected in their fields? Try Jerry Coyne's book, Why Evolution is True. Included a link. Donald Prothero, Evolution, What the Fossils Say, Why It Matters. Richard Dawkins, The Blind Watchmaker, Why the Evidence of Evolution Reveals a Universe Without Design. Michael Shermer, Why Darwin Matters, The Case Against Intelligent Design. Niles Eldridge, Darwin, Discovering the Tree of Life. Stephen J. Gould, The Mismeasure of Man. There's a lot of wonderful material out there. Why would someone read about their science from a guy who has no science background on a website that has no credibility in real science. Are they worshiping ignorance? That wasn't the full response. I told Natalie, I said, I'm I'm in a state of conflict. The nice guy thing just isn't working. <laughs> I want it to work. I beg, I plead, stop, stop with the emails. Just stop, stop, stop with all this. Just stop. I know it's hard for them. They're true believers. And I am at the helm of a community of non-believers with at this moment 75,000 people, part of it on Facebook. Our YouTube subscriber count is just about to hit 90,000 people. Videos have been seen by over 13 million worldwide. I understand their consternation. I get it. I understand. But three years is plenty, don't you think? So I was kind of a dick. <laughs> I thought, I thought, well, you know what? Being sweet and happy isn't working out so great. And I just lowered the hammer. God. Even now I'm in conflict over it. Part of me is thinking you just do whatever you have to do. Do whatever it takes to get some peace and 
quiet. Part of me thinks maybe I shouldn't have responded at all. I don't know. Tonight, all of you, you're like my bartender. Somebody gets all worked up after a crazy day at the office and they go out and they sit down and they go, let me tell you about my problems. <laughs> so, and after they're done, they vented, they've got that release and it all feels better. I am using you tonight because I don't want to be that guy. I don't, I, I really don't think it is largely, I don't think it is effective. But I also don't think I'm required to sit around and be somebody's doormat just because they decide I am their pet project. 36 months plus of you can't be moral without God. I've had it. I am not required because I share DNA with somebody else. I am not required to be a dartboard. They just write a little scripture on them and let them fly. They're going to fix me. So if the calm and quiet and friendly and warm and happy assertions of, well, you know, let's just agree to disagree haven't worked. And slowly we've ramped up in intensity. Stop sending me emails. Look, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Finally, <laughs> I've turned into a dick. <laughs> I've failed. I failed. And I'm sorry. I'm speaking at uh, an event in two and a half weeks in Tulsa. By the way, if you are anywhere near Oklahoma for the second annual Oklahoma Free Thought Convention, please come. It's like $10 for the ticket. Ten bucks. And um, David Silverman of the American Atheist is going to be there. Uh, Hammond from the Friendly Atheist will be there. Teresa McBain of the Clergy Project. She was their first female graduate. We had her on the show. I had her on the show. I want to say it was last uh, fall or summer before she actually came out. She called under a pseudonym. She was totally anonymous, called herself Lynn. And she said, I'm preaching every Sunday and I don't believe. And she was at that moment working to get out. She's going to be telling her story. And, it, and many others, it's going to be an amazing day. And during my speech, I'm the keynote no pressure. I'm the keynote. I'm going to vent again. In fact, the first 12 minutes are going to be a, well, <laughs> I'm just saying if you've ever been frustrated by the kind of thing I'm talking about, and if you've ever been in the debate arena and you literally grab your face because you hear this long debunked freaking argument over and over again. If you've ever wanted to just leap across the counter and shake someone and say, Google it. The first 12 minutes of my speech will be like sweet nectar for you. And actually the last 12. <laughs> we will come together as one. We will be one. You have my, you have my word. <laughs> I mean, part of it was therapeutic when I wrote the speech. I wrote it specifically for that reason, just because I thought I have got to get this out and I know others can relate and uh, it's going to be awesome. Freeok.org is the website address, by the way, for tickets on that deal. It's going to be awesome. And I, I'd love a chance to meet you. I'm also working on a brand new video that I came up with the idea for last, uh, last year. I, I'm not going to really tell you really too much about it. I, I'd like it to kind of hit you fresh. <laughs> but I hear another argument a lot, and I'm sure you probably heard a version of it as well. How can you have any meaning in this life if you don't have an afterlife? If you don't believe in heaven, why bother? Why bother? Yeah, there might have been a time in my life when I actually said something like that. I don't think I ever did, but I had that mindset, right? We're laying up our treasures in heaven. If you're going to just die and turn to dust, 
What's the point? Why not just kill yourself? Of course, now, looking at it differently, I see... I see life is even more precious because it's our only shot. And I'm working on a video now, which I think... I think will be unlike, I haven't seen anything like it, is unlike anything that has ever been produced for or posted to the internet. And I will debut it at the Oklahoma Free Thought Convention on June the 23rd. And as soon as I get home that night, I will log on and I will... Uh, uh, release it to YouTube so that you, everyone else who can't make the convention, can see it. I'm nervous about it. I'm excited about it. Part of me is using it therapeutically to deal with the fact that I, I <laughs> it, producing is is one of those things that it helps to to break stress a little bit. And I'll tell you, religious families can freaking stress you. As they say, sometimes the most damaging things are done with the best of intentions. 44-year-old man, and I'm being pawed at all the time. Can't leave it alone. I can't imagine if I had kids, which I don't. If I'd had children, my family was maybe going after my kids. I get, I get letters from people. Right? They're non-believers, and they raise their children in a free-thought environment, teaching them critical thinking skills, teaching them a love, love of science, teaching them to be skeptical, teaching them factually what different religions of the world do and what they mean and what they have in common, and encouraging them to figure it out for themselves, but also saying, I, as your parent, must tell you, I don't buy it. We are atheists. And then the grandparents, who are at church every time the doors open, believe it is on them to rescue the grandchildren from hell. So, they make the grandkids a pet project, get them out of the house whenever they can, just so they can whisper in their ears and say, hey, your parents won't tell you this, but you need to get saved. Jesus loves you with all of his heart, and he came to earth 2,000 years ago to die for your sins so you won't go to hell. Now, your mom doesn't want me to tell you all that, but I'm just saying it for your own benefit. God, if I was a parent and my folks did that, <laughs> oh, man, boundaries, they exist for a reason. And if you're going to come into my circle and you're going to make a claim, you're going to come into my circle and you're going to make an assertion, if you're going to present evidence, do some freaking homework, please, please. I had a parent give me a book. I think I mentioned this a couple of times, forgive me, but it, it's relevant here. When they talk about Richard Dawkins, they don't say his name. They say, that Dawkins idiot. They just say it like it's a proper noun. You need to read, you read this other book by Stephen Meyer or uh, you know, read, read somebody else. Michael Behe, somebody like that. You don't want to read any more of that Dawkins idiot. You're reading the wrong authors. What kind of point of view is threatened by another point of view? Then that tell, that, that just tells us something. You don't. You've been. You, you've, you know what? You're worship. You worship that Dawkins idiot. He's like your god. No. Here, read this book. Your dad and I got it for you. It's by Alistair McGrath. It's called The Dawkins Delusion. Mm hmm What's in the book? Well, I don't know. I didn't actually read it. You're kidding me. Yep, didn't actually read the book. It was enough that in the title, it said The Dawkins Delusion. Unbelievably lazy reasoning. Is this the worship of ignorance? Al Stefanelli is a retired journalist and author of Free Thoughts, a collection of essays by an American atheist. 
and a voice of reason in an unreasonable world, the rise of atheism on planet Earth. He volunteers sometimes as the Georgia State Director for American Atheists. He also uh, does some radio co-hosting. He co-hosts the weekly internet show called Reap So Radio and American Heathen Radio. He's been on Atheist Perspectives, on news and events. He's been on the God Discussion Show. Yesterday, he posted a piece on free thought blogs called Willful Ignorance, the Chosen Mindset of the Religious Community. And Al Stefanelli joins me now. Thanks for being here, man. Not a problem, Seth. Glad to be here. You have an article on free thought blogs. It's called Willful Ignorance, the Chosen Mindset of the Religious Community. Now, let me ask you, did you come from religion? I was raised in a secular home did not actually embrace religion until I was in my late 20s. And I spent 10 of the 15 years after that actually as a, as a pastor. I was a, a Southern Baptist minister. So you've seen it from the inside out, right? <laughs> I, have seen it from, I have seen it from both ends, as they say. Do you look back at yourself and see some of the arguments you made, some of the statements you made back when you were a pastor and now shake your head? Does that happen oh, to you? Absolutely. Not only does that happen, but it happens with great regularity because I'm involved in debates and involved in discussions and whatnot. Yeah, it does. And as a matter of fact, uh, I carry a certain amount of, of weight with me for the uh, the preaching and teaching I did on things like homosexuality and, and you know women's issues and whatnot. Then they come at you and say, well, you were never a true Christian to begin with. You're a counterfeit, right? If you'd had a real relationship with Jesus Christ, there's no possible way you could have rejected him. I'm sure you've heard that particular song and dance before. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's um, that's one of the most common ones that uh, that a lot of us get, Not not just former pastors, but oh, I anyone, who really has, uh, yeah, anyone who's, who's really had a, uh, a background in religion or, or even was a believer, they get that. You couldn't possibly have believed. If you had known Jesus Christ the way I know Jesus Christ, there is no <laughs> way you could have rejected him. You ask almost any of us, I'm involved in the clergy project, and that comes up quite often. And if you ask any of us, we'll tell you the same thing. That is particular throwback to us is actually insulting. We blow off, as you do too, just about everything that rolls off onto us. You know, we've got retorts and, and what have you. But that particular one uh, affects former clergy a lot because it completely negates everything that we had at work for, had gone to school for. It's basically saying that an entire segment of, of our lives was disingenuous. Why not marginalize this, right? They're going to try to take the teeth out of any criticisms we have against our former faith. And Absolutely. many of them honestly enjoy the fact that they believe. In fact, I have heard many people tell me, you're thinking too much, Seth. You're, you know what? You're thinking, you're trying too hard. You, you've got to go with it. You've got to allow God to guide you. So what they're telling me and different words, well, not necessarily all that different, is turn off brain and turn on my spiritual tuning fork, right? Allow the Holy Spirit to guide me. Don't overthink. We are not meant to understand. Have you ever heard somebody say that? We're not, we're just insects. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. His ways are higher than our ways. Yeah. There's a reason for everything. Or the best one yet, the best one yet is that the Bible specifically says that if you are not a believer, God has made it so you won't understand the Bible. I love that one. That's that's great. We heard that from an apologist just a few weeks ago, something like, it will obviously be insane to you because you're not a Christian. And then part of me is like, well, wait, wait, hang on just a second. How am I supposed to become a Christian if I can't understand the instructions for receiving salvation? Well, you require the leading. You must have a repentant heart. They've got all these hoops you must jump through. Let me go to your article here, to your blog on Freethought Blogs sure. about willful ignorance. You say this. You say, Charles Darwin said, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. Yeah, the word sure. ignorant is an adjective describing a person in the state of being unaware and is often used as an insult. Of course, ignorance is not always a pejorative, you say. There are many things I'm ignorant of because I have not yet 
receive knowledge. But there is an aspect of ignorance that continues to defy logic and reason that lives mostly in the realm of religious belief. We know this characteristic as willful ignorance. What do you think drives that? Is it they'd rather believe a happy fantasy than a harder truth? What do you think motivates people to remain willfully ignorant? Fear. It's it's fear. And then I believe I might have covered that a little further down in the article. It's a topic that I've written on quite often, and it's in both of my books. Fear drives the human desire to believe something, whether or not it's true or with or without evidence. The fear of going to hell, the fear of eternal damnation, the fear of punishment in the fiery pit of hell. Pastors, such as as former as had I been, and a lot of apologists will tell you that that is is not correct. That God is love, and it's all about love. But when you look at the psychology of it, if someone told me, "I want you to open your mouth and say that the Earth is six thousand years old," or I'm going to take this shotgun and blow your head off. Fear is powerful. It's a powerful motivator. It's funny. I did a uh, presentation at the Imagine No Religion 2 conference, and we're going to cover a version of this at, at Free OK, which is a, a conference in a couple of weeks, where we talk about some of the frustrations of dealing with the same old arguments. In your article, you say, and I quote, willful ignorance is an insult to the collective of human intelligence. Considering the vast amount of knowledge that is easily available, it is unconscionable that there remain living human beings who still believe in a young earth creationism, the efficiency of prayer, the concept of original sin, and the role that human sacrifice plays in its atonement. We live in the information age where even a tertiary search will probably find you relatively good information. We don't have an excuse for ignorance, yeah, do we? The stuff's not hard to find, you know? And, and even if you discount the non-scientific information out there, you've still got a wealth of information from the Smithsonian Institute, from the National Science Foundation. I mean, this is easy to find. All you need is an, an internet connection and the ability to, to, to type. Google will even correct your spelling for you. You don't even have to know how to spell it. I would give um, you a word of advice, though. If, if the search from Google takes you to, say... Answers in Genesis. <laughs> you, you, you might want to keep looking. I browse their site yeah. because I'm a masochist earlier today, and my head <laughs> still bleeds from the face palming. It was unbelievable. I was there 24 hours ago, and I'm still dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> You think to yourself, the the claims they're making aren't even fresh. It's it's the same recycled stuff. Part of me thinks, why are we still waste having to waste our time on these? There's so much new information we should be spending our energies on, and then still it's, yeah. how can you be moral without God? It's the same old thing, Seth, because it's been, I guess, the Council of Nicaea is, what, about 1,800 years ago, 1,900 years ago? Uh, it's been almost 2,000 years since anything new has come out. The Bible hasn't changed, with the exception of, of uh, when the uh, Reformation, when the uh, Protestant movement came. But the basic 66 books of the, of the Protestant Bible have, have remained the same. Well, those 66 books have remained in canon for almost 2,000 years now, or 1,800, 1,900 years now. There is nothing new for them to come up with. There is no, hey, you know what? God came down to Madison Square Garden, or uh, Jesus showed up on the Fenway Park Megatron, or whatever the hell they call it, <laughs> and, and gave us some new, <laughs> and gave us some new, there isn't. But... Every day, almost every day, somewhere in the world, a scientist somewhere uncovers, discovers, or reveals something that gives the individual one less reason to look up in the sky and say that God did it. So science is, is moving forward. It's evolving forward. It's learning brand new things in particle physics and quantum theory and, and, and every area and every angle and every hallway of science there's new information every day that is making that is adding to the collective wealth of human intelligence. But the Bible, you know, that that old hymn, I shall not be moved, you know, they're just yeah. they're not gonna go anywhere. <laughs> so they have to get they have to they have to dig even deeper into that part of the brain that can manufacture fantasy to come up with an explanation for every time science comes up with something. And and really it's almost laughable. 
I'm reminded of that song they taught us as children, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full mm -hmm. in his wonderful way, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his wonderful that. way. Whatever you do, if it's of the earth, don't look at it, right? Eyes forward. Keep your eyes on the prize. Don't be distracted. Don't be too curious. Turn off brain. Al Stefanelli is a journalist. He's an author, and he's got a great blog, which I will link, by the way, in the show description of this show so that you can go and just read it. But the article is called Willful Ignorance, the Chosen Mindset of the Religious Community. Real fast, Al, if you were looking for resources to combat some of these old arguments that you are hearing over and over again. Are there certain resources that you like that you, do you go to the Skeptics Annotated Bible or is there a website That's or a the, book? The Skeptics Annotated Bible is, is very good. Why, the, uh, why God Won't Heal, amputees.com is good. Um, the Christ Conspiracy by a friend of mine named Dean Murdoch um, and a couple of her things, uh, her books she put out, very, very in-depth. And always Ken Humphreys. Ken Humphreys has a website my memory serves me correctly. It is called, my memory is not serving me correctly. Uh, we'll, so I'm gonna, we'll Google it. Just don't find the answer at Answers in Genesis. Never, <laughs> you should Jesus be. never existed. Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> Jesus never existed. <laughs> Thanks for being so generous with your time, and we'll be in touch, okay? All right. You have a good night. By the way, if you are looking for other resources, if you go to thethinkingatheist.com, I have a resources tab with links, direct links, and it's a far from complete source, and I probably need to update it. I don't know that I have ironchariots.org on there, which is a travesty. I need to get Iron Chariots up there. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah, why God won't heal amputees.com. There's a link to uh, Sam Harris and Project Reason, God is imaginary.com. Uh, James Randy's website is there. Uh, Dan Barker, Atheist Nexus. American Atheists and much more. Plus, you will see links to various YouTubers out there. And there's a lot of great information for those who just might not worship ignorance. Had a message from Jonathan on Facebook. He said, somebody just told me I was a poor historian, which is what I do for a living, <laughs> because I didn't agree with a biblical view that the Jews built the pyramids in Egypt. Lest we forget, the pyramids were built 2,000 years prior to any mention of Hebrews in that area. Face palm. Thanks, Jonathan. Sam said, to me, it seems a lot of religious people are ignorant about the fact that one does not need God or gods to be moral. What are your thoughts? Well, what they often will say is that we are moral, but we lack objective morality, right? By what standard is it moral? And religious people are, by and large, not satisfied with the minimize harm tag. Uh, so they throw out those verbal grenades. Well, are you saying rape is always wrong? And if someone says yes, they go, well, that's an objective standard. Where do you get that standard that you measure your morality by? And if you are curious about morality in the evolutionary model, uh, there's a, a video by Franz De Waal. It's F as in Frank, F-R-A-N-S-D-E-W-A-A-L. It's called Moral Behavior in Animals. It's fascinating. It's a look at morality and culture and community and family and empathy in the animal community which many people didn't realize existed, but it sure does. And it's, it's like a 25-minute piece. It's fascinating. Also, Sam Harris, if you go to YouTube, uh, Google or YouTube the video, Sam Harris Science Can Answer Moral Questions. I found it fascinating. Elliot sent a message. He said, Seth, I was born in Northeast England and received my secondary education at Emmanuel College. It may be the case that you've heard of the school Richard Dawkins had when he wrote The God Delusion, naming both it and one of its staff members in his book. In my time there, I found there's an alarming level of ignorance of the Bible and that many people believe without knowing all the facts. However, even more disturbing than that is the acceptance of biblical atrocities. I found that in a conversation or an informal debate, when some of these atrocities are brought to light, often for the first time for many believers, context is asked for or some gibberish about not understanding God's will. If pressed further, a more disturbing truth comes out, they will more often than not wholeheartedly accept the atrocity. God says you can buy and sell slaves. Don't worry about it. God sent the Israelites to rape the Babylonian women. They must have had it coming. 
Lot's wife had second thoughts. She deserved to be turned into a pillar of salt. What begins as honest ignorance then becomes a more disturbing knowledge and endorsement of some of the more gruesome tales of the Bible. Sometimes it's hard to know what to say to someone after they literally endorse slavery and genocide. Elliot, I see it all the time. If I, have, if I had a dime for every time I've heard, it was a different time. It was a different time. I don't mean to keep slugging my website, but if you go to thethinkingatheist.com, you will see a tab called Refuting the Bible, and there's a whole section on Bible atrocities, because I felt like I was taught the Bible growing up. We heard about Jericho and Joshua, and the walls came a-tumbling down, and they taught it to us even as children in children's songs. Of course, they omitted the part or brushed over the part where they went in and essentially slaughtered every living thing, including babies. Just kind of left that part out, you know. We were busy celebrating Joshua's victory. That's exactly how most people read the scriptures. At the top of the Bible atrocities page, I say this to set it up, quote, many in the religious culture insist that the God, that God and the Holy Bible provide the foundation for all morality. With that in mind, take a moment to browse some specific examples of God endorsed atrocities. Then ask yourself honestly how you would feel about these accounts of rape incest, slavery, torture, and infanticide if the acts had been perpetrated by a human being. Doesn't your moral code require you to denounce these acts as horrific and monstrous? Do you hold God to a different standard simply because, well, he is God and he can do whatever he wants? Think about it. Even if Yahweh existed, would he be truly worthy of our praise and allegiance? Or is the truly moral person obligated to shun and denounce this petty, jealous, cruel, and murderous tyrant? I won't go down the list here on this show. But if you'd like to see the list, thethinkingatheist.com, go to the Refuting the Bible tab, and search down the Bible atrocities. It's not a complete list, but substitute someone else's name under God. Hell, substitute another tyrant, another a, a human monster of your choosing, one of the worst history has had to offer. Just stick his or her name in there. Just stick it in there. Read those stories again and ask yourself, how would I react if I read this in the headlines today? How would I react? The beheadings, the kidnapping of preteen girls to be raped by soldiers, plunging spears into bodies, dividing plunder to soldiers. And I'm not talking about just a few. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Slaughter. Oppression. Slavery. Substitute somebody else's name in there and just let me know how that works for you. Area code 580. Thanks so much for being so patient with me. On hold, what's your name? Oh, this is Brayton. Thanks for calling the show. What's uh, What do you have for us today on the issue of worshiping ignorance? What's your perspective? Well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say, well, I've been trying to call the show for several weeks now, and it's nice to know that there's another atheist in Oklahoma. Well, we do exist. I'm honestly, I was amazed. At the, I shipped a t-shirt to Oklahoma today, in fact. <laughs> I was just like, and after seeing the response at last year's Oklahoma Free Thought Convention and knowing that they are going to have capacity for three times as many this year, I'm way encouraged. I think there may be a lot more non-believers in this part of the country than ever felt confident enough to come forward. And they're starting to get some courage. They're starting to, to become emboldened. So, you know, be of good cheer, my friend. You are not alone out there. What else do you have? Well, my main issue with uh, creationists, mainly Christians, is, um, first of all, I'm, I tried to call in on the teen atheist show. I'm actually 18 years old. And uh, what I've noticed, especially in my own age group, is that 
the uh, creationist argument is the only argument they've ever heard. They don't know what the AC, what the atheistic side of the argument is. And so the only argument they accept as valid is the only one they've heard. And if they are blind or have been sheltered from the information, they are ignorant. We're not saying it is an insult, right? Ignorance is not a crime. You just don't know. So what? Then you present them the information? Uh, I will do my I'll do my best to present the information. A lot of them, well, like I'm sure you know, are not exactly keen on hearing what they don't want to hear. I mean, ignorance is bliss, and people do want to be happy, so they dismiss any information that they don't like. And honestly, to be a Christian in this day and age, you kind of have to dismiss any and all information that science, well, really the science provides, because nearly all of it contradicts what the Bible says. Do you think it's that they would prefer a happy fantasy over a harder reality, or do you think it's just such a big... One is such a stretch, such a course correction for them that they can't fathom embracing new information at this level. What do you think drives their acceptance of bad info? Well, it's, it, you can play it both ways, really. I mean, with someone who's, okay, take it 75, 80 years old, who's been a preacher for five, six decades, they're not going to want to re- admit, okay, hey, I was wrong for the past seven and a half years eight decades of my life, and this is the way it goes, and I guess I was wrong. That would be a very difficult step, I guess, wouldn't it? Yeah. And then you can go the other way that people honestly would rather be happy and maybe be wrong than face their right and admit that this is the only time they've got. Well, you speak wisdom, my friends. Thanks so much for the call. Much appreciated, and thanks again for waiting so long on hold. I appreciate being part of the show. Good talking to you, Seth. Take care, brother. 289, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? This is Nick. Glad you're calling, Nick. What's going on? Oh, uh, not too much. Just want to say I'm a very, very big fan. I've been waiting to call in and talk to you for quite some time. Thank you very much. Yeah, tonight I think was a good subject uh, because I've been having this conversation with a lot of people lately, the idea of willful ignorance and uh, things of that nature. Now, I, uh, I'm from uh, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, which I'm sure has a much different dynamic than where you're from uh, in regards to religion and whatnot. Uh, pretty lax up here, um, not a big religious community. But I get the impression as an outsider, a Canadian who's absorbed and saturated in American media, that there is this kind of this disturbing quality of willful ignorance and worshiping ignorance um, in the States. You know, uh, I mean, what are the polls at? Like about 50% of Americans are at least on the fence about evolution and climate change and stuff like that. I mean, this isn't unique to Americans, but there's this idea of, to quote Stephen Colbert, truthiness, this idea of truth by consensus, you know? Like, um, oh, well, if enough people think evolution is BS, then that makes it a fact. It's like, well, you know, science really is not a democratic process. Well, that's exactly what the article I mentioned at the beginning of the show <laughs> talked about. It's like, wow, you know, half of all Americans and that number is rising. And of course, you know, the universe doesn't really care whether or not you b- believe how it works. It just kind of does what it does. Um, exactly. And I know I know this sounds kind of pretentious of me, but I, when ha- having this conversation or this argument, it's like it doesn't matter if 99% of people think 2 plus 2 equals 5. 2 plus 2 does not equal 5. And when you find people like that, let's say that you find an American who is ignorant. <laughs> let's say that you had caught me... 15, 20 years ago, and I had said something like, well, there are no transitional fossils. Would you bother presenting the evidence to me? Would you, would you feel like you were wasting your time? No, you know what? It's, it's, it's a very interesting question. And on on that matter, obviously uh, my response would be probably facepalm. And then every fossil is a transitional fossil, but (laughs) I don't know. I don't really deal with it firsthand a lot up here, but uh But you got don't you aren't you guys heavy Catholic up there? Yeah, I, I I actually was just checking out the numbers recently and it fascinated me. Apparently most of us are Catholics up here. 
didn't really know that before. Um, my mother was Catholic. I was raised in sort of a liberal Christian environment, and there are churches everywhere. But, like, I guess the best way I could say it is there's a gr- really prominent Christian presence up here. It's just not the kind of Christianity that would maybe necessarily be recognizable to you. I mean, we don't really get up here hung up on the evolution thing or the homosexual thing. It's just like, oh, well, live and let live. It's kind of just, you know. Bring bring some of that down here. Bring some of that south, would you? Because we've got people tearing each other to ribbons in our school systems and our political processes about evolution and about the the rights of gays. And I mean, it's non, it's absolute. And I'll tell you, these people trod the Bible out. And every time they use the Old Testament to speak out against homosexuality, I find myself screaming, screaming, mind you, at the television. It's unbelievable. Of course. And then you will have some guy sitting in a red lobster eating shrimp with tattoos all over his arms talking about how Leviticus says homosexuality is wrong when he's wearing a shirt that's a cotton polyester blend. You know, that's true. And and, you know what I do? I send him to the, to the website, godhateshrimp.com. It's awesome. There's a website called godhateshrimp.com and these guys are brilliant. (laughs) They're just brilliant. Well, don't give up on us Americans. I know we've got some real major significant Face palm worthy challenges down here, but the tide for reason is starting to turn. So yeah, and I like I don't want to stand anti American. I love America. I love Americans. You know, it's just you know you get stupid everywhere you go. Uh, <laughs> well, honestly, I'm just turning the screw a little bit. I, I I know that that people like in Europe, I get messages all the time, and they're like, "What the hell's going on over there?" <laughs> And I'm just like, just I have just this like, weird just, sense that us Canucks might be a little more understanding because we're so close, you know, <laughs> to you guys. You, you're our neighbors, man. We're just we've got to make sure that we take care of each other. In the meantime, you know, folks, give us a couple of decades. We're swinging for the fences here. We're doing our very best to try to fix things from the inside out. Thanks for a great call and take care of yourself. Next time we're up in Canada, we'll try to buy you a coffee. OK, thank you so much. Seth. All right. All right. Take it easy. Uh, Let's see. I had a message in from uh, Marco. He said, about today's topic, worshiping ignorance, I think it's a bit more complex than that, he says. From my personal experience, I see people worshiping out of habit more than anything else. My parents, for example, my dad even went so far as to confide in me by telling me he did not really believe in God anymore, but he couldn't kick the habit of going to church. No, the motions of prayer at the dinner table listening to religious music. My mom is more confident in her faith, so he's just tagging along. I also remember that my childhood priest was uninspiring. He was going through the motions at Mass, and I thank him for that, as it helped me make up my mind at a very young age about the veracity of the Church's teachings and the Bible. I witnessed this up close as I was an altar boy until I hit 16, at which point I came out and told everyone I was through with church and did not believe, had not believed for at least four years at that point, actually. Other people worship out of fear, peer pressure, cultural habits, or other reasons. I don't think very many religious people actually do believe. They're afraid to tell, though, fear of being ostracized being their main motivation. I'm lucky to have lived the better part of my life in one of the most liberal countries in the world, the Netherlands, where atheists need not fear speaking publicly about their lack of faith. So I suspect a majority of religious people, including priests, pastors, rabbis, and imams, are in fact non-believers caught in a lie that is larger than life and impossible to escape. But then if you tell a lie often enough, it becomes your truth. Thanks for the letter, Marco. I find most people believe because they don't truly know what they believe. I can't tell you how often it happens, but it's, it's so often that it's, I'm, I'm try, or at this moment trying to think of the exceptions. Where you say, do you believe in God? They say, yes. So then you follow up, which, what God do you believe in? And they go, well, I'm a Christian. They, they don't say Yahweh or Jehovah or the Christian God. They normally just say, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. 
Baptist, whatever. But if you start to ask them specifics, it's a real challenge. And it's a, honestly, it's a pretty easy way to empty the room. <laughs> well, why did you choose the Christian God? I mean, why did you choose Yahweh? Well, I, I, was, I was raised in a Christian home, and, you know, we grew up, we, just, we, we learned about the Bible, and we learned the Bible was true. How do you know the Bible is true? How do you know this? Who authored the book of, say, Leviticus? Do you know who wrote the book of Leviticus? And they may have another book from Barnes and Noble sitting on their bookshelf, right? They're reading John Grisham. Or they're reading uh, one of the t t <laughs> Twilight books or whatever. They know who that author is. They know the publishing house. They know the date it was released. They know all of the information. They know when it came out in paperback. They know how much it cost on Kindle. They know the author's biography and maybe even have a bookmark to the fan site or the official web page. Maybe they read about it in magazines. Information aplenty. Who wrote your Bible? Well, God did. Now, what human being wrote the Bible? And then they freeze. Leviticus. 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 Ah, uh, I knew this once, I think. Leviticus. So you don't know who... Well, well, no, I mean, well, I can't think of it right now. Who wrote the book of Numbers? I know where you're going with this. Who wrote the book of Zechariah? Zechariah. <laughs> they found a name. <laughs> <laughs> How do you account for the discrepancies in Scripture where even the Gospels give differing accounts of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Different details, different things happening at different times with different people. How do you reconcile that? Well, you know what? I've got to go. Bye. <laughs> they don't know. And they don't want to know. It's too inconvenient. It's too much to digest. It's too much of a headache. It is too big. And I'd rather be happy. It's all I've ever known my whole life. Why muck it up? Why stir the pot? Why muddy the waters? Why? Hell, Seth, I look at you and I see all the stuff you've been going through for years. You can't get peace. Everybody's trying to fix you. Your email inbox is one freaking message after the other, and everyone's trying to tell you why you're wrong and coming up with crap information to prove it. You're irritable. You're cranky. You are becoming someone you do not want to be, mister. And I just don't want that for me. <laughs> <laughs> I can totally understand why some people check out. Why, why put yourself through it? Why do it to yourself? I'll tell you why to do it. I'll tell you exactly why you should do it for yourself. Because I'd rather live a difficult life truthfully than live an easy, lazy life with my head in the clouds. I would rather face opposition for what is right than go along to make things easy. It's more fulfilling. Trust me, overall, despite all the crap, despite all, despite the fact that occasionally I just could spit nails. Overall, I'm happier. I really am. It's like being comfortable in your own skin for the first time. And for years and years and decades, you're putting the square peg through the round hole and you punish yourself because it does not correctly fit. It doesn't fit. When you find answers that do make sense and are satisfying, despite all the crap you get from everybody else, let me end with a word of encouragement. And this is from a blog I posted 
at thethinkingatheist.com called Atheism on the Rise. For those who come and say there's a revival happening in America. There's a revival happening. Scientists, by and large, scientists, are they, they know evolution's junk. They're coming back to Jesus, folks. More and more people are eschewing the inherited belief systems of their families and cultures. According to the World Christian Encyclopedia, the number of, quote, non-religionists has skyrocketed over the last century across the planet. The number listed was 3.2 million in the year 1900. Seventy years later, it was 679 million. In 2000, 918 million with 8.5 million new apostates annually worldwide. The National Religious Identification Survey conducted by Trinity College in Connecticut reveals that atheism is on the rise in the United States. The Pew Research Center reports that younger generations are also significantly less likely than older ones to affiliate with a religious tradition. 26% of those under the age of 30 said they were, quote, unaffiliated. That's one in four. One in four that define themselves as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. In fact, today's 20-somethings, right now, twice as likely, twice as likely to be irreligious as their 1990 counterparts. I credit the Internet and the availability of information for that, by the way. A November 3rd, 2011 article sums it up in the subheader, How Generations Have Changed. Christian author Drew Dick agrees, saying, I think there has been a lot of evidence that they, young people, are dropping their religion at a greater rate than younger adults of yesteryear. He's convinced enough that he's written a book on the subject called Generation X Christian, Why Young Adults Are Leaving the Faith and How to Bring Them Back. Also notable is the recent dominance of best-selling atheist books in the marketplace. Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion was the number two hardcover on Amazon.com with sales well over two million by early last year. Christopher Hitchens hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list with his 2007 book, God Is Not Great. Sam Harris's Letter to a Christian Nation debuted on the same list at number seven. Millions are casting off the superstitions of their families and cultures and are proud to be counted as non-believers in the polls, in their households, and their places of work, despite so often having their characters, reputations, integrity, morality, and sanity questioned. Questioned, by the way, by people who worship ignorance. And as more and more people step forward... Those in the wings are indeed gaining courage, but the religious will not concede. They will not go quietly. As the tide continues to build, expect longer, louder, and more desperate protests, like the law enforcement officer who wrote the book on evolutionary biology. Desperate protests from the devout as they watch the foundation crumble under their wild, superstitious, and ludicrous claims. They'll position, quote, experts at the podiums and the pulpits. They'll scour the globe for signs and wonders. They'll stretch themselves to pretzel proportions to make sense of the nonsensical. And they'll give you that look of pity and treat you like you are broken because you don't believe in flying chariots of fire, giants, zombies, the levitation, talking donkeys, and people who live to be 1,000 years of age. And as the religious froth and clamor to defend their invisible father in his ancient book of angels and devils and curses and spells, just remember that more and more men, women, and young people are instead casting off the fairy tales and checking the box under irreligious, non-religious, no affiliation. Atheist. They're standing up and they're being counted. And for those recently free of their religious change, they are discovering the real world for the first time. I wonder what those statistics will look like in another 20 years. Thank you for the last 
hour and 21 minutes. I feel remarkably better. <laughs> A little podcast therapy does wonders. <laughs> I'll see you back here next Tuesday night as we talk about the atheist wedding. You're kidding. In a church? With a preacher? Details coming up next week. We'll see you Tuesday night. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com